Guardian, who was just released this Thursday. So let's all give a warm welcome to Alex. by just talking about our newest thing, so that everyone right. knows. Well, my newest thing is called Four. <laughs> and it's a series of short stories about four. <laughs> four stories about four, actually. Four being, you know, the primary love interest of the Divergent series, and also, you know, like a dude in his own, right? Um, and the stories are about his journey towards Dauntless and becoming a member, and then the fourth story overlaps significantly with the middle of Divergent. So um, it's kind of a retelling of parts of Divergent from his point of view. So that's four. Tell us about Proxy and Guardian. Cool. So uh, Proxy is also like a futuristic thriller um, set in a world where the rich pay for the poor to take their punishments when they screw up. It's about two 16-year-old boys, Knox and Sid. Knox is wealthy and privileged and good-looking and has the best technology and the best clothes and like a new girlfriend every single week and he never bothers to remember their names. He's a total, complete jerk. Um, <laughs> and he never has to face the consequences of being a total, complete jerk because he has a proxy. This orphan kid named Sid who lives in the slums of this city and who every time Knox screws up, Sid gets punished for it until Knox does something terrible. The punishment is way too much for Sid to bear and uh, he goes on the run. And these two boys end up caught up in this giant controversy together, this giant conspiracy, and they're going to need each other to survive. But they're going to have to survive each other first. So that's Proxy. And Guardian is the sequel. So stuff happens and then other stuff happens later. <laughs> <laughs> that was a spoiler free, right? Yeah, that was yeah, a spoiler that's good. Stuff happens. It's a story. There's conflict and resolution. That's what Guardian is. <laughs> well, resolution? I don't know. It's some form of resolution. <laughs> oh. Now people are like in the back going, ah! <laughs> <laughs> So you, you've written some iconic characters in Four oh. and Triss. I mean, they are they are big. I mean, you have a book coming out called Four. It's uh, true. So I would say that the prize is too iconic level. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, as I thought about these two characters who have such a place in our, our culture, that if they were cookies, what kind of cookies would they be? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, I feel that Triss would be a chocolate cookie with dark chocolate pieces. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> uh, just because. And that four would be a Rice Krispie treat because he'd be like, screw your rules. I don't need to be a cookie. I prefer cookie treat. I want to know what Sid and Knox would be if they were cookies. Knox? Knox would probably be there, so my favorite Girl Scout cookie is the, uh, I think it's- I have to take a word glance, I'm my favorite I also remember in Divergent there were like four references to like, kissing being electricity in some way, and I was like, oh my god, like, get another cliche, please. <laughs> I think I took all of them out because I was so proud of them. God, what? Yeah, what about you? Do you I, there's a lot of, there my soul. There's a lot of shrugging and eye rolling. Yeah. Um, a lot of eye rolling. If people actually rolled their eyes as much in real life as they do in my books, all of them, all the books I've ever written, uh, it, we are retinas we detach. Yeah. <laughs> but my more serious question is: Do you find yourself returning to similar themes or similar elements in your stories time and time again? Yeah. Yeah. I do. What are they? <laughs> An eighth grader once asked me to sum up all my works the thing that held them all together in one word, which I could not do. Oh my god. Uh, I said no. I think my answer was no. No. Uh, but 
I, I think a big theme that ties me together is it's this idea that you're not alone if you don't want to be. That like we, we are, I mean, the world is filled with people, and if you reach out and make yourself vulnerable, um, things happen that, that matter. Um, they're not always painless things, um, but it, it can get you through. And you know, in the world of proxy, it's often framed as like a debt that you owe each other. Right. Um, but in other books, it's, it's framed differently. Um, but this idea that connection is the only thing that can get us through. You know, ideologies, proxy, there's one ideology that sort of runs the world. Guardian, there's a different ideology that runs the world. Um, and it becomes dangerous when those ideologies replace humanity and people start looking to these big ideas instead of looking to each other. Which I think I am also obsessed with because the faction system is like that. Exactly. It's like this uh, system that we look to instead of looking to each other, instead of actually engaging with other human beings, we put them in categories and leave them over there because that's much easier. Um, I think one of my other obsessions is to have every character try to answer this question, which is, what do I do with my power? Um, and I think in the discussion of violence, this becomes particularly relevant. I mean, there are certain characters who engage in really violent behavior, like Marcus. Um, he's a powerful man, he has power over his family, and he uses his power for evil, as they say. Um, and or just more seriously, in a, in a genuinely harmful and destructive way. But Tobias's central struggle is to figure out what he should do with his power, and I think that comes up a lot in the short stories when he's learning how to fight and realizes that he's physically capable um, and that he could become like his father or he could decide to be something else and it's one of his, his big questions. But um, I find that every character I have is always trying to figure that out. <laughs> so I don't know what that says about me. Well, I think it's a very like natural, <laughs> like especially in, in young adult fiction, these teenage characters, I think that's such a natural part of being a teenager is realizing you have power. You can right. shape the world for good or ill but you can be the protagonist in your life um, and in other people's lives. Yeah, it's like the first time when you're like, I can leave the house even if mom says no. Like, I can just go. <laughs> and yeah, it's like, like do I? <laughs> well, I mean, because when you're a kid, you just like assume that the entire world is like yeah. living in your house and that when you leave, it's like dangerous or something. When you're a teenager, you're like, oh, I can actually occupy this world, um, you know, on, on my own and I can make decisions. And, what, and how do I make those decisions? What am I, what am I gonna do with this freedom and this like growing adulthood? Yeah. And you're gonna mess up. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Failure is inevitable. Yeah, which is one of the cool things I think in telling you, you know, these big sci-fi stories that people write, when the kids mess up, the stakes are a lot higher than it is for your average, you know, 15 year old in New York City. Right. Um, when they screw up the fate of the world is at stake, or other people's lives and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but I love it when they, I love when Triss and sort of Tobias, when all of these characters, when they get something wrong, when they screw up, or, or I love their flaws and their errors as they're trying to sort of learn how to be in the world and how to realize their power. Um, and they well, don't always get it right. That's one of the things I like most about Knox, I think, is that um, he's an incredibly privileged and ignorant person. And it's hard to read about a character like that, because you're like, I do not root for you. I am not rooting for you right now. <laughs> but a lot of people are like Knox. Like, I grew up a little bit like that. I grew up in a, in a wealthy town um, and as like a white straight person. And I have a lot of privilege because of those things. And it took me until adulthood to realize that, you know, um, what to do with that instead of, you can either like cast a shadow on the people behind you or you can try to figure out ways to step aside and, and let the light shine on other people and that's a really difficult thing to navigate. But I think Knox kind of figures that out through the course of the book, so I identify with him a lot despite also wanting to punch him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his privilege, his privilege. I also, I grew up very similar to you. I went to prep school and, and lived in a very wealthy area and didn't realize, but I, I grew up in Baltimore. Uh, in the 90s, where sort of downtown Baltimore was falling apart and uh, unemployment was really high and, and there was a lot of crime, and I was completely ignorant of it all. Um, I was much like Knox, and so when I wrote Proxy, I really wanted to explore that privilege and how, you know, you, if you grow up rough and hard and in a violent setting, yeah, it can, it can be bad for the soul, and that's what Sid deals with. Right. But privilege and an excess of privilege can also be bad for the soul. Too much privilege can destroy your childhood as well. Yeah. Uh, and so Knox learning how to live in his privilege, not deny that it exists, but how to use it maybe for good and not evil. How do I use my power? I'm telling you, everyone's answer is 
<laughs> or that's actually a really good tip for writers. If you, you're, humans ask that all the time. So if you can answer that about your characters, you, you're making good progress. Do you do you do anything else for all your characters? When you think, do you like plan your characters out? Not really. I mean, they kind of uh, appear in very different ways. So Triss came from a voice, just a voice. I wanted to tell the story, and then the character builds from that. She's very like super direct and kind of repetitive a lot of the time, and she really doesn't describe very much, which is partly because I don't like to write description very much. Uh, it's amazing how that happens. But uh, and Tobias was the narrator of the original version of Divergent. Yeah, like. I wrote a freshman year of college, so that's a really long time ago now. Um, but You're again, so old. I'm so old. <laughs> no, really, 26 this year. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> we don't have to have luck yet. <laughs> the slow and I'm, like march toward an inevitable death is how I think about it. <laughs> uh, well, I started writing the magicians uh, a long time ago, 2004. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you'll remember that 2004 was in the um, just absolute desert of time that stretched out between the publication of Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix and Harry <laughs> Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. So in some ways, I was just trying to write myself a little methadone to, <laughs> to get me through. Uh, and actually, you, know, you said the phrase thought experiment. It was a thought experiment. Um, uh, I, I, I began to think about... Uh, um, what happened if I was going to try to tell the story? Um, I, I was going to try to still tell the story uh, about someone who was more like who I was when I was uh, 17, I guess. Uh, actually, I started it more sort of Harry Potter age, and then I aged it up because my imagination was so filthy and obscene, it seemed wrong <laughs> to do this to uh, uh, high school age kids. Um, uh, and I, I, I started to think about, yeah, well, how would, what would, if you took this story, which is a very English story, and what if you, if you trans, trans, transplanted it into American soil? Um, uh, what sort of weird, twisted, twisted kind of vegetable would it grow? Uh, and, you know, things were, things were very different. The characters talked differently. Um, uh, they, um, they, they, they took drugs, they had sex with each other. I mean, that, you know, just, it was a very different kind of, uh, it was a very different kind of story came out. I'm a historian of science, so I study worldview. I study how people make up stories about the world we live in and how it works. And so, you know, I can tell you about how people made up stories about the world in ancient Greece and ancient Egypt and medieval Europe and how it changed and why it changed. And so it really was about thinking in my period, in the 16th century, almost everyone in the Christian West, Judeo-Christian West, believed that these supernatural creatures existed because they had a kind of worldview that supported it. In our technological era, it's a little harder to explain why so many people love these supernatural beings because our worldview doesn't really support them. So then I had to think about, okay, so if, if they're real, like my research subjects believe, what would need to happen? Well, vampires could not explode in sunlight because if my neighbor <laughs> was in that situation i would know <laughs> vampires can't like sparkle or have fangs for same reason you know if my neighbor had fangs i would notice this and i can think well they can't just like be working the night shift at the police station and the hospital which is so it was like that for each of these groups and then i had to explain why human beings didn't see these creatures and i was like oh well, but the human being's special talent is obviously denial. <laughs> so that was how I said I wrote you. That's where we went from there. Love, how about you? How did you create your frame, the framework for your world? Um, <clears throat> I, I was, I was, I was desperately, as as Deb was answering, I was going to write, does, my, does my world have a framework? <laughs> <laughs> I, be, I better create it one does. right now. It does. <laughs> It's not too late. Um, there was a lot of, uh, you know, there was just there was just a lot of thought experimenting. Honestly, mm -hmm. uh, I, um, uh, you know, in some ways, I was uh, uh, working with this idea of telling this very um, traditionally. Uh, well, like Joe Walling had the Potter books mapped out. Um, well, let's start with you. Can you talk a little bit about what, where you got the idea and what it was like? 
Well, the idea really began as a sort of thought experiment after seeing a very large display of books about werewolves, fairies, witches, goblins, ghosts, vampires, etc. at the Puerto Vallarta airport. And I started thinking if there really were all of these creatures living, like where did they live and why didn't I see them and what did they do for a living and how might they date? And I started <laughs> writing about that. And I think I thought I was writing an op-ed piece on the popular fascination with supernatural creatures. Uh, and then my uh, people started talking to each other in my head, which sounds really crazy now that I just said that. Um, and, and I started to write and sort of eight weeks later I had about 100 pages and I thought, I think I'm writing a novel. <laughs> and, and, and I thought when I started that I was writing a novel, one book with three parts. And part one was in the present, and part two was in the past, and part one was in the present. So sort of like an Oreo cookie of a novel. And then I hit about page 400 of part one and realized that <laughs> this could not be a single book. Um, but it was always structured as, as that with that kind of back and forth movement. And I knew where I was starting and I knew where I wanted the middle of the journey to be and I knew where the end was. But it was almost like um, planning a road trip from Los Angeles to New York City where you know that you sort of are going to take these major highways but you don't know what exit you're taking to get like coffee or where you're going to spend the night and so even though there was a plan there were also all kinds of really wonderful detours so kind of a mix of those things well did you did you feel like you were able to close all the loops up in the third book because you have a lot of balls in the air there yes a great personal sacrifice because the thing i love most about writing is coming up with new characters but if you're actually trying to finish a trilogy, there's just a limited number of new characters you can introduce before your editor threatens to kill you. So, um, so I, that impulse to kind of want to go this detour and oh, let's put this person in. You, I had to, you had to be, re I don't know if Lev found this the same, but I had to be extremely disciplined about um, sort of taking lots of extra exit ramps in book three, because then I'd never get back on the highway to get you to the end. He is the creator of the enormously popular Humans of New York blog, which started on Tumblr and boasts more than 5 million, I'm sorry, 7 million social media followers. The blog, a collection of photos and insights from New Yorkers of all walks of life, has inspired coming next. At the end of the panel, there'll be an audience of Q&A. So without further ado, here is David and Brandon. So their moms were standing, and they just happened to be standing next to each other. They didn't know each other. But they were both looking up at something at the top of the subway, a sign or something. And they both had the exact same expression on their face, even though they didn't know each other. And I remember I was so nervous on my camera, because I didn't know if you could take pictures of people. This is my very first people picture, without, you know, pe without people yelling at you or getting mad. So I remember I was like, so nervous, I kind of held up my camera, and then I kind of made eye contact with the mom, and she smiled at me, and I'm like, okay. And I took it. And I remember just looking at it and being so proud of it. Like just having such a sense of fulfillment of getting this like people picture. And I was like, that's special. And kind of that feeling that I had, that feeling of like having found something and captured something, is the feeling that all of Kansas and New York was built on. That one feeling of like, oh, this is something special. Like I just, I got something special here. And I just took that and, and, and attempted to replicate it 10,000 times. That feeling. Shannon, don't feel, this is just to demonstrate, so don't feel pressured to say anything profound or anything. 
because Shannon's at a disadvantage. Normally, I do these interviews just one on one. In fact, something that's very interesting about humans in New York that just always fascinates me is that somebody could know that their picture is going to go on a blog or their story that night and be seen by millions and millions of people. But if they're best friends with them, they'll completely clam up. Isn't that interesting? So Shannon's at a very big disadvantage because we're doing we're doing this in front of hundreds of people. Normally it's a very intimate process, but she's agreed to step up here and help just so I can kind of demonstrate what I'm thinking when I'm approaching people. Um, so Shannon, you're just sitting there. Let's say you're working at a you're working at a, a Starbucks and uh, you're outside taking a break. And so I see Shannon across the street. Um, and so one thing, the, the first rule I always have is never approach people from behind. Because, yeah, no, I found that, you know, if you approach somebody from behind, no matter how good you do the rest of the process, if their first interaction to you is one of fear, it's over. So what I always do, even if I'm behind Shannon, I will run around <laughs> just, just to approach her from the front. And so, like I said, when I started about two out of three, people said no, and now about one out of every three people say no. And so what is it that I've learned from that, that to double the acceptance rate? When I was first starting, I was always experimenting with words. And what are the exact words I'm going to say to allow a stranger to let me take your photo on the street and then really open up to me? I was like, I experimented with using the word photograph versus portrait. Do I explain everything, or do I just, do I just kind of ask if I can take a photo? And then along the way, I realized it really had nothing to do with what I was